Let me ask you to turn to Hebrews in chapter 13. And while you do that, uh, let me ask Ba Chendela and Mrs. Chendela to stand. Uh, Ba Chendela and Mrs. Chendela to stand. Should have done this a while ago. Uh, A number of you have seen, particularly Ba Chendela, for some Sundays now. Ba Chendela is a student at EU, and he's been asked to come and do his field education here at Indola Baptist Church. In the course of the year, we probably may have one or more students uh, join Wachendela. So we welcome you to Ndola Baptist Church, Mr. and Mrs. Chendela. Welcome. Please be seated. Verse 10 to verse 16 of Hebrews 13. Grateful to us epistle that accepted uh, to preach from the same series. Many times a preacher is hesitant uh, to deal with the same subject somebody else is handling, uh, and so he dealt with uh, a passage that comes before, uh, let us follow, let us go out to Christ outside the gate. And so we will not be treating that one. Uh, This will function as the last segment, but we will do an overall conclusion. The 10 of Hebrews 13 to 16, the scriptures read as follows. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place Places by the high priest has a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Notice that our following him is also the basis of our being invited to offer sacrifices of praise to him. We must continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise as unmistakably underlined in the contents of the exhortation of Hebrews 13, 15 to 16. We must continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise is unmistakably underlined in the contents we stated or in the details of the exhortation in Hebrews 13, verse 15 to 16. Underlining and emphasizing that call, we observed the other Lord's Day, the exhortation itself offer up the sacrifice of praise to God. We said that this is Old Testament language. We observed, secondly, that sacrifice is a major subject in the book of Hebrews, but also in the whole scriptures. We observed, thirdly, that there are sacrifices that have discontinued, that have become obsolete, There are sacrifices that still continue or remain. Among those that remain is the sacrifice we are invited to continue bringing to Christ, to God, and to the Holy Spirit. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. 
under that observation or that detail, one more observation regarding the exhortation itself before we consider the second detail or the second content. But as you read verse 15, we will notice that sacrifice or praise or worship is sacrificial. It involves sacrificing to God. Here is the language of the text. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Notice the wording of the ESV is that this is literally reflecting on the activity of actually coming to the altar and putting on the altar. So literally lift, if it's an animal, lift it up there and wait for the smoke to ascend to heaven. That is the picture that we've been given here. In other words, give this to Deprive yourself of something as an act of worship to God. So worship is sacrificial. It's the same language in Romans 12. Therefore, give or sacrifice, offer your bodies as living sacrifice. Give yourselves. And that picture of a sacrifice involving sacrificial a cost is clearly demonstrated in the Old Testament. That you read in the Old Testament to summarize that whole picture that you do not come to God empty-handed. You come with a gift. You come with something you let go. You deprive yourself of. You offer up to this glorious God. Sacrificing or sacrifice religiously defined is foregoing something, surrendering something, giving up something or letting go something as an activity of worship. In its simplest form, sacrifice and sac sacrifice is basically defined as a gift to God. It is a presentation to deity of some material object or time or ability, the possession of the offerer as an act of worship. What is underlined in the word sacrifice is that the one that is doing this is giving from what the Lord has blessed him, is presenting whether it's material as we did in offering and tithes, whether it's regarding time as we've come to worship together, whether it has to do with abilities in singing as the praise team have done and the media group are serving us. That that is the implication and the emphasis of the sense in the text. Through him then, let us continually offer, give up a sacrifice of praise. It is religion in action. In early times, almost the whole of religion, an inseparable accompaniment of all religious exercises, Worship is sacrificial. Sacrifice is giving to God as an act of worship your best. Again, you read the Old Testament language. You do not just give whatever you want. You give what is prescribed to God. That even the things you bring to him are not simply things you think this is okay. And it is sad that sometimes, if not many times, particularly to do with offerings and tithes, that it would not be surprising if we check the notes we bring to church 
it's something that we've not thought about. It's, it's a last minute activity. So where's my purse? Is there any money there? Yes, there is a 10 kwacha. Great. That's for offering. That's careless giving. Read the Apostle Paul in writing to the Corinthians, prepare in advance before they come for the collection. It is sacrificial giving. It is a sacrificial act, but it is a sacrificial act of the best. Beloved, worship, put simply, is not cheap. It will cost you something. It has costed you fuel to come here. It's cost you money to jump on a min bus. If you are in the praise team, this is not the first you coming. You came yesterday. It's expensive. It's sacrificial. You give up something. You, you give up time. Uh, all of us asked here whether we have something we could have been doing regarding our family businesses, our family matters, or work. There is work pending. But because worship demands that you give up something, that you sacrifice, this is not simply like I stated the other time, something you do simply at your convenience. Okay, I don't have anything to do. Now I can go to church. Now I can go to the ladies' meeting. Now I can go for the praise meeting. Now I can go for the Bible study. Whatever the nature of the Bible study is, it is let us offer up a sacrifice of praise. Worship is sacrificial. Stated sacrifice is giving to God as an act of worship your best. Abraham was tested with the very best, very costly. His only son. His only son. As an act of worship, the best animals, birds, grain, oil, fruits, is what was required. It is ultimately the giving of ourselves to God. It is ultimately the giving of ourselves to God. Your commitment to God, your worship of God, the thing that you give to God in worship are an indication of your complete surrender to him. Read the Apostle Paul regarding the offerings that a church in the book of Corinthians in exhorting others gave. He says they gave beyond their ability. But here is something they did first. They gave themselves. So having given themselves everything and anything they have would not be more valuable than themselves. And that's the injunction in Romans 12. Let us give ourselves as a living sacrifice. Belong to the praise team. You stay in Indeke. I know one stays there, but I'm not sure how they come. And is your reason for not coming every Saturday because Indeke is far? I have news for you. Worship requires you to sacrifice. You work from Kitwe, like Mrs. Liena. You're required to be at the praise team, but you must be in Kitwe. I have news for you. Worship requires sacrifice. You are a busy man, the head of Northrise University. You have loads of things to sign. Will those keep you away from the worship of the Lord? I have news for you. Worship requires sacrifice. Are you a student and you're struggling with an exam in two days? Will that be an excuse to keep away from worship? I have news for you. Worship requires sacrifice. Read the text again. Verse 15. Through him then, let us not once continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Well, the second detail 
The second content, that was the first, the exhortation, and had four uh, areas of reference or details under details. But the second observation regarding this continually bringing a sacrifice of praise is the detail that has to do with the sacrifice of praise and the kindness defined or restated. This offering of praise that we invited to bring is restated. It is defined, and it is defined at two levels, basically defining worship comprehensively, but in very summary language. Verse 15, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. At that point, you ask the question, what is this? And the author tells us that is the gift, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. The fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. But then verse 16 supplies another component to this act of worship altogether. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So the sacrifice of praise and the kindness stated or defined or restated. The author here is showing the means by or through which the sacrifice should be offered our lips. This is a sacrifice of words. It's a sacrifice of what we confess. The, fra the phrase fruit of the lips is a Hebraism, meaning what the lips produce. That is, words. And all that is telling us here is that worship includes words. Thoughtful words, accurate words, biblical words, not just any words, but words that would be offered up to God and God would accept them as pleasing. Proverbs 18.20 reads as follows. From the fruit of his mouth, a man's stomach is filled. With the harvest from his lips, he is satisfied. In other words, what a man speaks has a fulfilling and satisfying effect. Or the reverse is true. Notice that worship as defined in verse 15 and 16, and in the whole of scripture, is essentially inward and ethical. Worship, as described in verse 15 and 16, is essentially inward and ethical. And here is where I'm getting this. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. In other words, the words that would be acceptable and pleasing to God are the words of those that have conformed to the standards of who this God is, to the character of this God, that acknowledge of the people that submit to the name of God. But it's not only inward and ethical in truth and in spirit, but it's also outward and practical. It is also outward and practical. Verse 15, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, notice that both in verse 15 and 16, there is a sense of giving something. When you share what you have, you deprive yourself of that thing. If you have 100 kwacha and you give away 50, 
What you had was 100. You share that 100. Kwacha, you no longer have 100. You will have less the amount given. And that what is calling here pleasing sacrifice to God. Again, underlined worship is parting away with something. Worship does involve words, but it's not exclusively verbal. It involves actions and motives. But it's not every leap. Let's not be misled, beloved. Sometimes non-religious people, non-Christians use very nice words. So if they are newscasters after the news, they almost inevitably in Zambia close with these words, God bless you. They have no relationship to this God. Now the words are true and the desire may be right, but they are not necessarily pleasing to God because of the source. God is not looking for words first. Is looking for the person. Look at the text again. Verse 15. Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips. But it's these lips that acknowledge his name. It's the lips that confess his name. Whose sacrifices will be pleasing. So the question that text then brings to all of us gathered here is simply this. We have sung songs together. And when we're singing glory and honor, was that the song? Uh, to the ancient of days. For a moment I'm thinking, I don't think we're singing the song properly. Because it goes with a certain reason. Glory. Now, that coming from me counts a lot. <laughs> we, we may have sung. Well, the question is, are your lips, are you actually a person whose lips acknowledge him? Are you a person whose lips confess Christ? Simple language, are you a person who can truly say, I am saved so that my words are truly what I mean. Glory and honor be to these ancient of days, but I also belong to him. Or will he speak of you as the, the Lord Jesus Christ does in the Gospels? They worship me with their lips only, but their hearts are far away. If that's what you do, your worship is not pleasing. Your, your, your worship, as we read in Proverbs, is abominable. It's a mockery. It's hypocrisy. So I ask again, beloved, do you acknowledge Christ? Do you acknowledge God? Not simply that he exists, but as your savior, as the one that has dealt with your sins and mine. Is he the Lord of your life? Or you govern your own life. It is the lips of those who acknowledge him. But this worship, which is the fruit of lips, is not forced. It is a natural outcome of gratitude. So that when he tells us in verse 15, that is the fruit of lips, he is basically saying to us this, that this worship of a converted, of a saved person is a natural response. It's not a portaling the kuboko. It's something you do as a natural thing because of your indebtedness to God. So that if we had a worship leader, as in some churches, and absolutely okay, that when we're singing together and they are leading us in singing a song, 
they need not repeatedly to say, no, no, stop, stop, stop. You, you are not singing very well. Uh, let's start again. Up, up, up now. Let me hear five of you this side. They don't need to do that. It must naturally flow. If I gave you, now obviously to some of you, this is not much, and uh, this is how much I can afford. If I gave you ten kwach, now to some of you, you'll be grateful. Think, yeah, yeah, okay, I mean, but to some of you, be thinking. <laughs> Yeah, and if you were to teach day. The response to that gift will depend on what the gift actually means to you. If it's a gift that you appreciate so much, you don't need to be forced. You don't need to say like we say to children when they're given a lollipop or they're given ice cream and they just grab it and the mother turns and say, and what do you say? And then they say, thank you. No, that's, that's cranked. Uh, that is kicked out of the child. No, that's not what is being called for here. It's the fruit of lips. It's, this is what the lips produce the lips that acknowledge this God. That the natural thing these lips do is to worship. This praise or worship is not forced. It is a natural outcome of gratitude. The words of praise from our lips coming from our hearts is like beautiful fruit laid on the altar. This prayer should be natural. It is called the fruit of the lips. Fruit is a natural product. It grows without force, the free outcome of the plant. So let praise or worship grow out of our lips at its own sweet will. Let it be as natural to you as a regenerated man or woman, boy or girl. You do not need to go to a mango tree and tell it. Now it's time to flower. Unless it's sick, you may need to cultivate, manure, water it. But if it's a mango tree, to naturally as a proper response, you don't need to beat the mangoes out of the tree. Implication is this, and he stated this, that it is sad in our time that our commitment to the Lord's work, our commitment to God, is really a forced business. It's really a forced business. I say this not to excuse the elders or any ministry leaders, but some of our thinking goes like this. If the pastor has not visited you in two months, you stop coming to church. I'm not going. These elders have never visited me. Oh, that's true, and that's bad of elders, but that's no excuse not to worship God. Or, they didn't do this, but they did this for that one. We are imperfect people. We will make mistakes, sometimes very serious ones. But this worship must come as your natural response to what the Lord has done for you. Unless he hasn't done anything, we don't need to be forced. The problem of any ministry, any church must be all the members come on the Lord's day, therefore there is no space. Because that's the natural response, rather than some come just on a few Sundays. But notice from the text that true praise is from a penitent or repentant heart according to Hosea 14.1.3, a text that is quoted in verse 15. True praise or worship comes from a repentant heart according to Hosea 14, verse 1 to 3, which is the text that is quoted in Hebrews 13. Hosea 14, 1 to 2 reads as follows. 
Return, all Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity, accept what is good, and we will pay with booze the vows of our lips. That text is in the context of repentance. Return, all Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Another story to illustrate particularly the naturality of worship. And it has to do with the Puritans. And in the reading I did, it's probably the source of what the Americans refer to as the Thanksgiving Day. This is probably the most likely source of it. In the early days when the Puritans settled in New England, that is, in the U.S., they were always having fast days. They had a fast day because they were having a scarcity of bread regularly. Another fast day because the Red Indians invaded them. Another fast day because the sheep had not arrived that they expected. And they had so many fast days that they began to get exceedingly weak. After a long while, one very wise brother said, Did they not think it would be as well, now and then, to vary the thing and to have a feast day occasionally? Would it not be quite as acceptable to God if instead of mourning over mercies they wanted, they were to thank him for mercies enjoyed? So they instituted what is called the Thanksgiving Day, which became a perpetual ordinance afterwards. The Thanksgiving for mercies received. There is a reason and wisdom in such a course. How dare you and I go and ask for anything else before we have been thankful for what we have? Here's my simple question by way of definite application. What have you said thank you to God for today? What have you said thank you to God for today? What has been the fruit of your lips today to God? I know that if we prayed this morning, almost all of us had something to ask of God. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this and that, and that, also that. Well, slow down. What has he done already? What has he done already? Are you building? Yes, common language for builders. Building is expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are waiting for the towels on the floor. Who has provided so far up to this stage? Why are we almost in a mood of like, you see, this God is being slow. We've done the roof and the ceiling, but there's no bus stop. Why haven't you reflected on how far you've come? This vehicle, you know, yeah, the, the spark plugs, especially in the cold season, the spark plugs. Oh, how long has it saved you? Ten years. Surely isn't that long enough to say thank you? If you like me, miracles do happen. You gain a little weight. So you realize some of your trousers are becoming small. Guess what we say? Wait a minute. Why, why don't you stop and say, I think, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a, uh, I can have a pot belly after all. Why are we not this grateful? The Puritans realized they needed to be grateful. Let us not be like some people who, when they are given help, still go out with an ungrateful face 
shrugging shoulders, basically saying, is that all? Thanksgiving Day, an annual national holiday in the United States and Canada celebrating the harvest and other blessings of the past year most likely has its genesis here. The only sad part, the majority of those who celebrate it in America and Canada have nothing to do with the Savior of the world. Have nothing to do with that Savior and the genesis of it. What we have in this verse is a Jewish maxim. A Jewish saying stated that in the time of the Messiah, all sacrifices shall cease, except the sacrifice of praise should not cease. To this maxim, the apostle appears to allude and understood in this way, his words are much more forcible. This was in effect quoting the authority of one of the Jews' own words, the author is in effect saying now is the time of the Messiah, that Jesus is that Messiah, that the Jewish sacrificial system was now abolished and that no sacrifice would now be accepted of God except the sacrifice of praise for the gift of his son. That was the second detail. The first was observing the exhortation the second, the sacrifice defined or restated. It is the sacrifice of lips that acknowledge his name. But thirdly, and we touch on this very quickly, the one through whom this must be done. The one through whom this must be done the one through whom this exhortation can be accomplished. Verse 15 begins with that word, if you're using the ESV, through him. It is through him, the one that was reflected on verse 10, up to that point. But picking up in verse 12, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, through him, through this Jesus Christ, through him then let us. The means or the medium through whom the sacrifice must be offered to be acceptable is Christ. Through him or by him as a tone of exclusivity. Through him and him alone. This sacrifice, worship beloved, is not pleasing to God if it does not come to him through his son. You say you worship God, but you have no business with Jesus Christ. Your worship is in vain. The one through whom we come to the Father is the Son. There is no other name given on earth and in heaven by which we are saved, but also by which name we live. It's through Christ. Beloved, let's be clear that we know the God we worship. Because many people will say to us, we also believe in God. We need to stop and ask, which one? Is this the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Or is God who existed as Father, and at some point as son, and now in our time as Holy Spirit? Or he has always existed as a trinity? We worship the Father, we worship God through the Son. Not through Muhammad, not through some tree uh, in Mongu. The teaching of scripture here and in the whole book of Hebrews and elsewhere in the scriptures is that whatever we give or offer to God outside Christ is unacceptable by God. 
It is through the sacrifice of Christ, the work of atonement. We are sanctified or consecrated and fitted for our priestly service. Christ is a high priest and sacrifice. He is the only one who is efficient or competent and sufficient or enough a means for this worship to be accepted. And that's the context. Let's go out with him outside the camp. If we are to be true disciples of Christ, we, we go with him. And only then can we offer sacrifice. So if you are seer one and they ask you, which powers do you use? And you answer, ancestral powers, your worship is not acceptable. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter how many followers you have. If your religion is outside Christ, you are not saved. You are in the most dangerous place. Here is my question, beloved. You say you are saved. Is the conviction that you are saved simply because of Christ? Or it's Christ and somebody else or something else? No, the text says through him exclusively. Well, what about people who worship other gods but they are sincere? Through him. Well, what about you? They have done this for the rest of their life. Through him. Or well, even their forefathers taught them through him. Exclusively no one else. If I was Albert Martin, I would say with no apologies. But I am not. I persuade you. Be clear that your worship is through Christ. But secondly, be clear that your worship is to God. Be clear that your worship is to God. So the third, the third detail was the means or the medium through whom the sacrifice must be offered to be acceptable. The last is that the one to whom worship exclu exclusively is to be rendered is God. Verse 15 and 16. Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This can not be overemphasized. Please, I beg you, whatever respect you have for human beings, it must never fall in the category of worshipping them. Please don't. But when we also see other people worship other people, it's not a laughing matter. It's not humorous. You know, look at the way he's kissing the papa's feet. And we laugh about it. You know, look at the way they are drinking water from which the papa has bathed. And we laugh about it. No. That's a terrible abomination. No human being, no angel, no any being in existence other than God must be worshipped. Whatever the man of God or the woman of God, the pastor, the elder have done in your life, they may have pointed you to Christ. God may have used them. You may have been in a terrible situation. They helped you to come back. They are simply vessels. They are not objects of worship. I call na ukubale mia avantu. That's Greek. <laughs> Please, I beg you. And in this matter of worship, beloved, it has to do with even what we say. You know, the fact that I stand up to preach and anybody does not mean we cannot be criticized. 
does not mean that the content of the sermon cannot be questioned. We are not gods. We are fallible. We make mistakes. And the more we speak, the more propensity to make mistakes. We are human beings. Please, I beg you. Some of us, you know, I am not sure. No, we, we look very sound today. We come to Ndola Baptist and people ask us, which church do you go? Which church, of course, Ndola Baptist. But during the week, you are full-fledged charismatic. Your hero is Benihin. No. God. 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 Some of you are probably offended that I said Benihin. My point is this. God. Not Conrad. Not Lama, not Phil Hunt, not Zimba, not Porter's House, uh, not Bishop Imakando, uh, not uh, Dunamis, God must be worshipped. Amen? God. So those heroes on TV, don't worship them. Not Joel Lustin. God. Not the late uh, heroes, God. Not even Zacharias, God. That's the one we worship. That's what the text says. Let me conclude with another story. One year, when Christmas Day came on a Sunday, a farmer decided to go to church. Like some people, he thought he was fulfilling his religious obligation by going to, to church twice a year at Christmas and Easter. The sermon that day was preached from the text, the ox knows his master, the donkey his owner's manger, but Israel does not know God. My people do not understand. Isaiah 1 verse 3. Isaiah is saying that some people are dumber, dumber than the animals, after church, the farmer returned home and he stood among his cows. One of them began to lick his hand, a practical demonstration of the sermon he had just heard. Strong man though he was, the farmer began to weep as he thought, God did much for me, and yet I never thanked him. My cow is far more grateful than I am. What do I ever give her other than grass and water? That's all we do to our gods. That's all we do for our chickens. That's all we do for whatever animals we keep, food and water. That's all I do. If you came home, uh, my dogs know the horn of my vehicle. If you came home and honed, they will just lift up their ears and be ready to pounce. When I horn, they come to the gate. All I do, give them food and water. You should see, when I wake up in the morning and open doors, they run to my sons. The way they run to me is different. They wag and jump around and bark, basically saying, this guy is a bomb. It's my dogs. The application is unmistakable. Let's be grateful to God. Amen.